Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's session, Frequently Asked Questions from the American Society of Clinical Oncology. I'm Mary Jerome, Director of Medical Multiple Research. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Alicia Danielle Roberts and Rosie Pruitt from the Winship Cancer Institute at Emory. We've invited all of these ladies here today to answer some of our frequently asked questions that we've received from caregivers about the recent years or ASCO. So let's jump in. So I'd like to go to offering topic. My first question is to you, Dr. Joseph. Um, a three study comes to a regimen that includes implicity as induction therapy. So can you tell us whether a four drug regimen is part of the standard of care for newly diagnosed patients? And if so, what is of a four drug regimen over a drug regimen? And how what did the trial with implicity tell us? Yeah, absolutely. So first, I just want to say thank you so much, Mary, for organizing this and everyone for organizing it and for Danielle and Rosie for, for joining me today. Um, I just want to say for the audience, if you're having a little trouble hearing Mary, if she was cutting out, <clears throat> you're not alone in that. We are, too. And so we'll try to work on that. And I'm just going to repeat the question so that you know what she said. So um, and thank you for joining us. Um, so she was asking about in the newly diagnosed space, the role of triplet versus quadruplet or three drug versus four drug regimens and specifically from ASCO this past June to talk a little bit about the the abstract that look at the addition of elituzumab with KRD. So I think starting first with three drug versus four drug regimens. So as things have evolved in myeloma, we have continued to kind of add drugs. You know, we started with doublets and we went to triplets and now we're looking at quadruplets. And in general, we have noted that when you add additional drugs, we're seeing improved efficacy. And that's the goal, particularly in the upfront setting. The caveat is we want to improve that efficacy or how effective the regimen is while minimizing overlapping toxicities, meaning every time we add a drug, we're potentially adding side effects. So we want to be really careful about that and cognizant <clears throat> of that. So keeping that in mind for standard risk patients, historically, the standard of care has been RVD which is Revlimid, Velcade, or Vertezimib, and Dexamethasone. And so the Griffin trial, um, which is a recent phase two trial, looked at the addition of daratumumab or Darzalex, which is a, now a subcutaneous injection, in addition to RVD, and really showed improved efficacy in terms of depth of response, MRD negativity, um, both post-induction and, and later in, in uh, treatment, post-transplant, post-maintenance, et cetera. And so for us, we use DARA-RVD pretty routinely for standard risk patients. I think the question of, of triplet versus quad is, is a little up for debate in the high-risk folks. We tend to use triplets, um, namely KRD, but we've also started using a little bit of DARA-KRD, but I think that's a select group of patients um, you know, for that regimen, just given some of the uh, toxicity issues. In terms of this abstract, this was a study um, out of Germany. It was a randomized phase three. It was a large study looking at KRD, so carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone versus elituzumab plus KRD. And elituzumab is also a monoclonal antibody similar to daratumumab or isatuximab, but it has a different target, which is SLAM F7. And so basically the endpoint of the study was looking at depth of response or MRD negativity. And for those of you, usually everyone who listens to these is very well informed, but MRD is, stands for minimal residual disease. And it's basically just the most sensitive tool we have for detecting myeloma. So at the most sensitive level, can we, can we even see one myeloma cell? And um, they met that endpoint. They saw higher rates of MRD negativity in the ELO KRD arm versus KRD. And these are patients, just to back up, who had induction therapy with either the quad or the triplet. They had transplant. There was actually an option for second transplant in patients with high-risk disease. Then they got consolidation with the same regimen they were assigned to, and then maintenance with either ELO LEN or LEN until progression. So it was, it was similar to what we do for upfront patients. And so they saw better depth of response. In terms of toxicity, 
They saw some similar toxicity between both arms, but I'll just point out that there were several deaths on study and there was a non-zero rate of cardiotoxicity, which we see with carfilzomib. And I, had, I don't think it has anything to do with elotuzumab, but it's, it's really the KRD backbone. So I think the bigger question is, you know, is KRD, do we need KRD in that front setting, knowing that the point is to get people successfully through induction to get them to transplant. So if we're having heart failure or cardiotoxicity that is preventing or delaying people from getting to transplant, is that really the best regimen to use up front? So I, I don't think it has anything to do with ELO, but it's still worth noting. And then I think the bigger take home for me is, yes, a quad versus a triplet seems to be better. But I think, again, the goal is finding a quad that we can deliver safely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I that's thank you for that very complete response. And I have heard similar things from um, from other uh, folks in the myeloma space. So it's really great. Um, so Danielle, in general, would giving four drugs instead of three increase a patient's risk of side effects? And I think we've gone over that a little bit. So in your experience, what have you seen? So in our experience, I mean we. We use a, quadrant, or a quad therapy for upfront therapy for standard risk patients prior to transplant. So we're using daratumumab RBD, as Dr. Joseph stated, and it's overall very well tolerated. Um, I mean, the goal is to increase their response and decrease the side effect profile, and I think we're doing a good job of doing that. Patients work full time while receiving um, these regimens. As with everything that we give, there is going to be some toxicity associated with it, but I think the toxicity, especially with in the upfront setting is minimal, and we're able to use the appropriate supportive medications, whether it be Lamotil for diarrhea or Imodium for diarrhea, and then using on Dancitron, composing things to help with nausea. Um, but in general, the upfront setting, I think the quad therapy is very, very well tolerated. We're obtaining great responses and getting patients to transplant. If we take that same information and move it later on down the line when people have had more and more therapies, I think that that changes the discussion a little bit. But even still, we've used it successfully in the relapsed refractory setting for certain patients. And again, maintaining responses and um, addressing the side effect profile with supportive medications and able to allow people to still have a good quality of life while coming in and receiving their therapy. Mm -hmm. So, so we already talked about implicity KRD, and now you were just telling us about DARA RBD. So, are there other four drug regimens that that you guys have used in your clinic? I mean, I think the main other four drug regimen that we've used besides DARA RBD is DARA KRD, mm -hmm. which um, was studied in the master trial and the concept trial and other trials. And you know, I think particularly for high risk patients. So I don't think we've, we're doing that routinely. I think it's an ongoing discussion because some of that data is a little early, but um, you know, that's a very effective regimen. There are high rates of MRD negativity in those trials, you know, in the, the 60% range. And I think it's just a little bit about toxicity. I think there's a, there's a select patient that maybe can tolerate that, that, you know, cars twice weekly and there's weekly and it can be a little much for some folks. But um, for the most part, I think the quad we use most commonly is DARA RPD. Mm -hmm. So, Rosie, following an induction regimen, and in most patients, a stem cell transplant, patients will receive some form of treatment, which is known as maintenance therapy. So before we get into the details um, of the next presentation that looked at maintenance therapy regimens at ASCO, can you remind us why maintenance therapy is necessary for patients, and what is the current standard of care for maintenance? Sure. Um, so currently our standard of care for standard risk myeloma patients would be single agent Revlimid in most cases. Um, and then patients with high risk myeloma, we typically recommend a triplet regimen, whether that's um, Revlimid, Velcade, Dexamethasone, or like Dr. Joseph alluded to, Kyprolis, Revlimid, Dexamethasone, something like that. And we don't always do the triplet maintenance indefinitely. Sometimes we um, aim for three years and then reassess disease status and downgrade to single agent revlimid if it's safe to do so. Um, and so, I mean, I just, I personally believe maintenance therapy is so important. And I often tell um, patients that I compare this to like the one two knockout punch. So induction and transplant is, is us knocking out the myeloma. The maintenance is us, you know, keeping our foot on it or keeping pressure on it so that we can make sure as best as we can, it doesn't get back up anytime soon. Um, and so 
Our institutional data has shown that patients with standard risk myeloma that have gone on to single agent revlimid maintenance achieve about six years on average of progression-free survival on maintenance. And we know that a deeper and a longer sustained first remission leads to better overall survival for our patients. So maintenance can sometimes deepen that response over time, and it appears to certainly lengthen that response. Um, and that's definitely why we think it's so important. And, and a large part of our patients, like we said, we can do things to make maintenance very tolerable um, and to not significantly impact quality of life so that we're having patients living the lives they want, but still maintaining control of their myeloma. And then keeping quality of life in mind, you know, we are starting to investigate if and when um, discontinuation of maintenance therapy or even treatment breaks would be appropriate. There is very limited data on the role of stopping maintenance therapy, but I'm hopeful with more time and just data analysis that we'll be able to identify a population of patients where it would be safe to stop or take a maintenance break after a certain period of time. But yeah, like and we have seen some presentations at some meetings with some of that data, which is really pretty interesting. So we'll have to see how that sort of plays out over time. So um, Dr. Joseph, there was a phase two study of a three drug regimen as maintenance therapy for patients with high risk myeloma that was presented by your colleague at Emory, Dr. Ajay Nuka. So first, can you tell us what constitutes high risk myeloma? Yeah, so I think that that honestly is being debated and I think is changing. In general, I think we can think about it in two ways, and that's genetic high risk and biologic high risk. So there are certain changes in your plasma cell that make it a myeloma cell. And of those genetic changes, because people often get confused when we say genetics, because some cancers are hereditary, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the specific change in the plasma cell that made it malignant. And there are some of those changes that, that I say make a smarter myeloma cell. And so, you know, as a result, we have to be smarter back and a little bit more aggressive. And so the more, most common changes we think about are translocation 414 and translocation 1416. Translocation just means a swap of genetic material between chromosomes. And then deletion 17P, so deletion of a part of, of, the, of chromosome 17. Um, and then gain of 1Q, but particularly high numbers, additional copies of gain of 1Q is often thought of as high risk. Um, so not in this abstract. And then biologically, we think of things like extramedullary disease. So having myeloma outside of the bone marrow uh, is high risk. And then certainly plasma cell leukemia or circulating mm -hmm. plasma cells, we often think about high risk. In this trial specifically, Rosie kind of already alluded to our approach of risk stratified maintenance therapy, which we've been doing for over 15 years. And he has previously published on RVD maintenance. And after the Forte trial, we've started using KRD maintenance a little bit more regularly. So the idea behind this trial was really using the most effective potent drugs we have to try to prolong PFS in these patients, particularly the ultra high risk patients, which are folks who have more than one of these high risk features because they really don't do as well as the standard risk patients. They tend to relapse sooner. And again, the goal is to try to get the best and longest remission that we can, particularly that first remission. And so in this trial, he defined high risk which is standard as DEL17P, translocation 414, 1416, and plasma cell leukemia. And so the idea was post-transplant, these patients were on maintenance therapy with carfilzomib, pomalidomide, and dexamethasone for three years. I think about 60% of the patients uh, were double hit, meaning two high-risk features, and about 60% of the patients were also black, which I think is notable because mm -hmm. of where we are. Emory's in Atlanta, and so a lot mm -hmm. of our trials, we are very fortunate to have a diverse patient population enrolled, and that's not always the case, you know, just based, not, not for a lack of sure. trying, but based on patient populations. It's really important to have uh, patients that are representative of the community on these trials, otherwise it's just not applicable to everybody. Um, and so what he found was really impressive BFS and OS. So after three years, 60% or so of patients still hadn't progressed and the overall survival was in the 70s, which, you know, might not seem great, but it actually is very impressive in such a high risk group of patients. And this was a particularly high risk if you look at the specific genetic changes in the folks that were included on this study. So I think it's just a very promising um, initial report a way how we can manage these patients better. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in general, particularly for ultra high risk, regardless of what we do, doesn't seem to work. So we need to start thinking sure. out of the box. Right, right, agreed. 
So Danielle, for patients currently that are taking only Revlimid as maintenance, would there be a time where they should consider maybe adding on other agents to their maintenance, for example, if their M protein values start to go up a little bit? So that's a great question. It's a really common question that we get in our clinics. And so when patients are on maintenance Revlimid, we are typically checking labs anywhere between kind of one month to every three months. And it depends on where they are post-transplant and how stable they've been. It's not uncommon for us to see a biochemical relapse. And what we mean by that is that M spike may be slowly increasing or maybe if it's your free kappa light chains or your lambda light chains, that's your marker. We're watching those numbers slowly start to trend up. But if somebody's completely asymptomatic, no bone pain, we've done additional scans or PET scans and we're not finding any evidence of bone disease and the rest of their labs are all completely normal, especially looking at that CRAB criteria that our trend really is to continue to monitor that slow progression of numbers. What we want is we want to extend the, the amount of time that we can we can for these patients where they have a good quality of life, if they're tolerating the Revlimid. If we're adding on additional agents at that point, one, we may have be starting that too soon, which can shorten that that overall course for that relapsed or relapsed free time period, but we also could increase toxicity at that point as well too. So really what we're doing is kind of slowly watching those numbers, try to limit the amount of anxiety and stress that may cause the patient. Um, but at the point we start to see what we consider more organ damage, which is really that CRAB criteria. So the calcium levels increasing, they're becoming more anemic or they're renal function is declining. At that point, we are now looking to say, okay, this your myeloma tends to be causing more issues. Now's the point in time that we need to start thinking about making a treatment change. Sure. Great. Thank you. So, um, Rosie, as, as we're discussing these, um, these regimens, we just discussed induction regimens. Now we're talking about maintenance regimens. So should patients who are taking um, more than one drug as maintenance expect to have um, a higher incidence of side effects from taking all of these medications at once? And what do you suggest for patients for their quality of life while they're on maintenance, whether it's single agent or you know more than one agent in maintenance? Yeah, so... <clears throat> I think t technically, yes, right? As you add more agents, you're increasing the, so the side of potential for side effect profiles. But I wouldn't necessarily say that it's additive or that patients that are on doublet or triplet maintenance necessarily have more intolerance issues. Um, I think whether it's single agent, triplet maintenance, whatever it is, the most important thing is being followed by a provider who is knowledgeable and comfortable in managing those side effects. Um, and on the patient side, it's just being open and being um, communicative about what's most disruptive to the quality of life. So, for example, an infusion-based maintenance therapy, if it's trying to work around a work schedule, that can be accommodated. We can talk about timing of treatments or infusions, possibly weakened infusions, if that allows for better quality of life. And then thinking about side effects, there's a lot that we can manage. I mean, dose reductions, interval reductions, timing of medications, those kind of things, and just managely, appropriately managing supportive interventions like Danielle um, said, we love our Lomoto, we love our Cholestapol. There are just certain tricks that we have that are really, really effective at making these maintenance therapies um, tolerable. Um, and so I think it's very rare that we have a patient that really can't tolerate anything and it happens. And for those patients, we, we just observe them. But I think for the most part, we're able to manage side effects. So patients are living the lives that they wanna be living. Mm -hmm. It's great that we've sort of gotten to this point where there's so many medications to help people get past these side effects so that they can receive, you know, appropriate therapies. So that's really a good thing. So let's move on now to talk about uh, relapsed refractory patients and CAR T therapies. So just like last year, this year's ASCO brought us several updates on the CAR T therapies and also a lot of information on bispecific antibodies. So first, let's talk about data relating to the two FDA-approved CAR T-cell therapies that are currently available to patients, Abecma and Carvicti. So there was a presentation on the final results of the trial that led to Carvicti's approval, and another presentation on the real-world experiences with the use of Abecma. 
Dr. Joseph, a couple of questions for you on these presentations. So the first is, what key takeaways should patients know about the CARVIC-D study? And how is it possible that CARVIC-D got approved before these final results were complete? Yeah, so um, CARVIC-D got approved. It had a priority review and an early designation because we saw such promising results early. But these were the final results of the study. And I think if the, the one thing I heard everyone talk about was 35 months. So the average, the median BFS or the average survival of patients receiving cell cell in the study was almost three years, which is really impressive, particularly yeah. in the relapse refractory space. Mm -hmm. This is a heavily pretreated patient population, right? This is not a newly diagnosed patient. So that was kind of the buzz, buzz around it. And I think um, remains are really effective tool in the relapse refractory space. I think the challenge of CAR-T in general is about logistics and about access which we'll talk we are going to talk about a few things that that's evolving but you know right now both uh siltacil and idacil are approved for patients who have progressed through four or more lines and as many many of you might know as as disease as myeloma continues to come back it gets a little trickier and sometimes things take off a little faster than they might have in earlier lines and so having the time to wait for manufacturing and delivery of car t-cells can be really challenging mm -hmm. so moving into the next abstract that was presented so this was looking at the role of bridging therapy um, in ida cell and so this came from this is a retrospective analysis in the real world setting over 200 patients um, were the data was gathered across the U.S. This is from the Myeloma CAR T consortium, and they about 79, 80 percent of patients received bridging therapy in this group, and so they were able to compare bridging therapy patients versus non-bridging therapy. And the aim of the analysis was to see does bridging therapy have an effect. And they grouped the bridging therapy into image-based, PI-based alkylators and selenexor. Um, and what they, you know, what they looked at when you look at the patients who receive bridging therapy, I think not surprisingly, they tended to have higher stage disease, so mm -hmm. RA2 or 3, higher mm -hmm. risk disease. They tended to have worse performance status, and there was a higher risk of extramedullary disease, which is not overly surprising if you think about it. If you need therapy to bridge, bridging therapy is just therapy that we use to get you to the cells while they're mm -hmm. being manufactured. Mm -hmm. It makes sense that those patients have a little bit more aggressive disease. And so what they found in terms of toxicity is not particularly, no significant differences except for there tended to be longer hospitalizations in the BT group. And um, there were slightly higher um, rates of neurotoxicity or ICANs in patients who had received selenexor. And this is a very small group of patients, but I thought that was interesting because selenexor crosses the blood brain barrier. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's worth keeping in mind if you're using selenexor right before CAR-T, maybe that's not ideal, or maybe we need to think about longer washout. But in general, there wasn't significant toxicity. And I'll also point out there wasn't a lot of responses to bridging therapy, and there was no significant difference between um, you know, in terms of response. So then when we looked at response, in general, the bridging therapy group didn't do as well. The progression-free survival and the overall survival was not as great. In between bridging therapy groups, the alkylator group did did the worst, but there were small numbers of patients. So, you know, it's a little hard to tease out, but that's what we tended to see. The image groups tended to do a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think the, the answer to the question, you know, is does bridging therapy matter? Does bridging therapy affect efficacy? I don't really think that's the question. I think all we're seeing here is that if you need bridging therapy, you might not be the best patient for a CAR-T because right. we're forcing it, a right. little, for lack of a better word. And, and you're so, basically in kind of bad shape to begin with, right? So the result might not be as good. It's not ideal, but the problem is we don't often have options. And so that mm -hmm. might be what we're, what, what we're pushing for because that's the best we have. But I think what we're working on is getting access to CAR-T in earlier lines. Mm -hmm. And we're getting, which we're about to talk about, is we're able, we're starting to be able to manufacture CAR-T in a shorter period of time. So yeah. currently, we're waiting anywhere from four to eight weeks. And that's a long time if you have rapidly evolving myeloma. And so mm -hmm. being able to manufacture that in a couple of days, mm -hmm. um, you know, really makes a difference. So I think that's where we're moving. And I think that's some of the bigger take homes from that, that study. Agreed. Agreed. That's great. So, so Danielle, from a practical perspective, has the process of getting patients access to Abecma and Carvic D gotten easier? Um, when these drugs were first approved, it was very, very difficult. There were very long um, waiting lists to be able to get into the manufacturing facility, and each center got maybe one or two spots per month, and it was really very difficult for patients to access these therapies. So, um, has that gotten easier? And 
are there more patients that are able to access these therapies from their myeloma specialist or their oncologist? So like what have, uh, experiences have been like uh, where you guys are at Emory? So I think the access has gotten a little bit easier recently. Um, even in our own practices here, we're seeing higher numbers of CAR-T patients off trial, like using commercial um, FDA approved um, CAR-T, and we're having more slots available to us. We're getting these patients in and taken care of. It's like Dr. Joseph said, it's still a process. So we're still, you know, from a manufacturing standpoint, there is still the time between the collection of the car of the T cells to the time we're able to administer them. Um, so that part has gotten um, is definitely still there from a length of time. But the overall patient access and the number of patients that we're taking through um, has definitely increased more recently, which is great for our patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is it's a really great thing. So. So Dr. Joseph, many in our audience are curious to know when the next generation of CAR T cells might be available. So we heard about three new CAR T cells at ASCO, all with numeric designations for now, um, PHE-885, GC-012F, and CT-103A. What can you tell us about these agents and how are they similar or different from ABECFA and Perfect? Yeah, so when we're, when we're trying to improve upon CAR T, and this is coming from someone I'm not in the lab, but you know, when we're trying to improve about, upon CAR T, we're thinking about improving the persistence of these CAR T cells, the efficacy, and reducing the toxicity, and then of course trying to get these cells with reduced manufacturing time to get them to the patient sooner, as we as we've been talking about. So all of these kind of hit one of those boxes. So the PHE and the I can't remember the letters, I think it's C CTO. Both of those are using um, newer, um, no, GCO, sorry, um, using um, newer manufacturing like T-Charge for PHE to make these CAR T cells in less than two days, so two to three days. And when across the board of all these trials, you're seeing very high response rates, so very promising in terms of efficacy, um, duration of response, depth of response, so those are all good things, but also, being able to access these things earlier. And then the third CAR T cell is using a fully human um, CAR T cell receptor. So that's that's really relevant in terms of reducing immunogenic, immunogenicity and reducing toxicity. So these are just all different ways of how, how we can make these CAR Ts more effective and tolerable, but also get them to the patients sooner. I don't have a when they'll be available, unfortunately. You know, these are mostly early phase trials um, and they take some time, but I think really exciting and encouraging that we're seeing such promising results. For sure, for sure. So speed is of the essence, right? To be able to get uh, our patients these therapies. So so let's talk about the late breaking abstract that was presented on the use of Carvicti in patients who had previously had one to three prior lines of therapy, which is actually much earlier than what it's currently approved for, which I think is five, right? Five or more, or is it four or more? Cool. Okay. So um, so everybody was really excited for this data. In fact, it was funny because it was leaked from EHA and, and they talked about how amazing it was, right? So even before they presented it at ASCO, people were talking about it. So so, um, so what did we learn from that study? And do you think that CAR-T will eventually be used earlier in the treatment plan as a result of this data? Yeah, I love that it was leaked. It makes the myeloma world feel like Hollywood or something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, CAR-2-4, I mean, the, the take home was that we used CAR uh, cell to cell in an earlier line, one to three prior lines. We compared it to standard of care. So it was uh, Daripom-Dex or pom -Vel dex um, and, and cell to cell one is, is, the, is the, the short version. Um, there was better depth of response and duration of response. And so I hope so, right? That's the point of this trial is that we're showing that it's more effective or you know, than some standard of care regimens and earlier lines, so we can gain access to this this therapy earlier. So my expectation is that we're that's where we're going. Right, right. So yeah. I think that that um, Janssen, the company that makes Carvicti, has already applied to the FDA yes. yep. for this new indication, and Abecma has also applied for um, for approval as an indication in earlier lines of therapy. So yeah. we'll see how how that sort of all works out with the FDA in the coming months. Right. It'll yeah. be very exciting. 
Okay, so we're going to turn now and talk a little bit about bispecific antibodies, which was arguably maybe the main class of therapies that was discussed in myeloma at ASPO this year. So first, let's review the data that was presented on Tech Bailey, which is the bispecific that is approved by the FDA for myeloma. Danielle, what more did we learn about Tech Bailey at ASPO? So teclistumab, I think, is very exciting for our patients. Um, we, you know, you get to that four, three or great three or four line um, where patients have had multiple lines of therapy, and the options start decreasing, and overall survival rates, and then the rate of durable response actually decreases typically instead of this patient population. And then looking at the study, we actually proved that for these patients who have had multiple lines of therapy, that we can extend some response rates up until almost 24 um, month. Somewhere between 11 and 24 months was depending on your risk factors and how many lines of therapy that you had. Um, but for our patients, this has been a, this, a great option for them, especially when we look at the CAR-T, you know, and the amount of time it takes for patients to get CAR-T. If you have somebody that needs therapy and they need it quickly, we're able to move to teclistumab for them, offer this line of therapy for them, and, and have response rates and overall great toxic or great side effect profile and less toxicity. As with CAR-T, the biospecifics do carry the risk for having um, CRS type um, symptoms. So our protocol is to do the ramp up dosing schedule in patients so that we can adjust for that. Um, once they have you know, successfully had their ramp up schedule, they're tolerating, they're coming out, we're doing this in an outpatient setting, which is fantastic for our patients. They're coming in once a week um, and it's a subcutaneous injection usually in their abdomen. So you know, no IVs and a lot of um, injections and things like that and typically pretty well tolerated. There is a group of patients that we've seen have some site type reactions, but we're able to manage that with a lot of times using some antihistamines, both orally and topically to correct for that. Um, I think the other really important piece for this clinical trial was the fact that over time, when patients had attained a response, we're able to decrease the um, amount of, or the frequency of giving the injections. Mm -hmm. So if you had had a partial response after cycle four, instead of getting it weekly, they started decreasing it and doing it every other week. Mm -hmm. And that's great for patients for two reasons. One, they're not coming into the clinic every week. So in terms of quality of life and time spent with us, less time is always gonna be better. But then also from a toxicity standpoint, especially, and we're gonna talk more about this in a few minutes, but when we look at the infection risk associated with this class of medications, maybe decreasing the amount of times that they're coming in, giving their T cells a little bit of a chance to recover is actually gonna help improve from that toxicity profile as well. Um, but in general, I think we're all super excited about the biospecifics and having access for this for our patients. And there's more of these that are gonna be coming into market and we're gonna be using them more and more in the years to come. Sure. So speaking about more of these coming along the pike, um, Rosie, we heard about two um, Two additional BCMA targeted by specific antibodies that are in development right now, linvoseltamab and elranatumab, both of which are not yet approved for patients with myeloma. So did the information that we saw at ASCO on these tell us anything new about this class of drugs, particularly how effective they are in patients who have already received a BCA targeted treatment, such as a CAR-T or maybe um, valantinab methadone? Sure. Yeah, I think um, they just continue to show that this class of medications is is really promising in general. Um, so the limboceltamab showed um, an overall response rate of about 64% um, at the 200 milligram dose, which is, again, that's pretty high in patients that have been heavily pretreated. Um, and the probability of maintaining that response at six months was as high as 85, 89%, which is just really, really encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, you know, again, looking at side effects, it's all very comparable to what we're seeing with the other BCMA therapies, the cytokine release syndrome, you know, fatigue, anemia. Those are there. Those are showing to be about the same. Um, the safety profile is comparable. Um, when we think about more severe, like neurotoxicity side effects, um, the severe side effects or ICANN's ratings of greater than a grade three were one to two percent. That's pretty small. Um, so again, I think it's showing good tolerance, promising results. And then um, alranitumab was um, part of a study that showed a pooled analysis for efficacy and safety in patients that had already received BCMA therapy. So people that had um, 
you know, antibody drug conjugates or CAR-T therapies um, specifically and looking at how effective this drug was in that patient population. And overall, the response rate was a little bit lower, but it was still around 45%, which is really, really good. Um, I think it shows us that, you know, again, in a heavily pre-treated pa- patient population that have already received a BCMA therapy, there might be a role for re-challenging them with another BCMA or a bite or bispecific. Um, And we might just need to look at more specifically the timing between those therapies or potentially an interim therapy with a drug from a different class. Um, But it did show success, which is really exciting. And just one other thing I just wanted to add, just for comparison, we're getting spoiled with bispecifics when we look at when we think about overall response rates in the 60 to 70 percent. You know, usually drugs that receive approval in myeloma have an overall response rate around 30 percent, which is what daratumumab had, which is what Belamath had, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, 60 percent, 70 percent or higher is is very impressive, just can't yeah. overstate that. Certainly in these in these heavily pre-treating patient populations. Correct. Yes, yeah. the amazing data, so. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Joseph, we did hear about another bispecific antibody called called uh, talquetamab at ASCO, and this drug has a different target. It targets GPRC5D on myeloma cells. So what is GPRC5D, and how was talquetamab used in the studies that were presented? Yeah. So, um, you know, the the good, the BCMA therapies are great. We have, we're very excited about all these BCMA therapies. The downside of BCMA therapy is we need something else to salvage patients who progress after BCMA, right? And as Rosie alluded to, though, there's probably a role of re-challenging, certainly not right away. And so we, we've started looking at different targets that we can, um, that we can use, both in bispecifics and in CAR-T. And so GPRC5D stands for G protein coupled receptor 5D, it doesn't matter, but it's another antigen on the surface of myeloma cells. So it's just another way of targeting myeloma cells. It otherwise works in a, the same way as to Clostimab or BCMA by specifics. And so um, there's a couple different abstracts that came out about talcatamab. One was looking, is the redirect study, which is looking at talcatamab, which is uh, with teclistimab and relapsed refractory myeloma, which is the first time that we've looked at two different bites with different targets. Yeah, um, that so was really that study. Very interesting yeah. and very exciting. And I think in general, we're gonna see more and more of looking at bites in combo, right? Bites mm-hmm. in combo with each other, bites in combo with other standard agents in myeloma and moving bites up. That's always how things go. If they work in the relapse project setting, you're gonna combine them and move them forward. So there's gonna be a lot more data coming out like this. But the, ta- the redirect study I thought was interesting um, because you're, you're kind of dual targeting mm-hmm. the myeloma cell at the same time. Um, and I think the main kind of concern is about toxicity. It was very effective. There were high overall response rates. And um, talcatamab, the GPRC5D agents, do have um, some slightly off um, so different side effects that we see. So very commonly we see dyskusia or changes in taste buds and appetite. Um, and we also see commonly skin and nail changes, which can be, you know, upsetting for, for some patients. Um, and so, you know, one of the things was at, does adding to clostimab really increase that? And we didn't see that, um, mm-hmm. which is good. And then I think the other thing we always think about in bispecifics is infection. And so there was about a quarter of patients with grade three or higher infections. But I think the other point to make, I mean, I think infections are just going to happen. And I think the 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 kind of line is making sure we're not crossing a threshold, but also making sure we're optimizing management. Mm-hmm. And so a good number of these patients had low antibody levels, which we call hypogamma globulinemia, but not, I think about a quarter of those patients received what we call IVIG, which is a way where we give antibodies back. So I think there's still room to kind of improve upon that. And then the other study Oh, sorry, that was done. Sorry, I was misspoken. That was done in the DARA study, which I'm about to speak about. But I think the same thing holds true in terms of, um, of managing, you know, infections and making sure people are getting prophylaxis. So the other study I was going to tell you about is talcatamab with daratumumab, and so that that hypogamma applies to them. But um, that was also, you know, again, I think using DARA and then using talc is a little concerning in terms of infection risk. Um, so that's important. But, you know, it was effective. We saw good response rates. It's a little early, I think, for that study. But um, I think that's, we're going to see more and more of those types of companies can best optimize those drugs and, and minimize toxicity. And it's going to change if they move to earlier lines, but you're still going to have infection risk. Okay. So if you had to guess, 
how soon do you think we'll have another bispecific antibody approved for myeloma patients? Do you think it'll be this year? I think it'll be this year. Yes. I, I, and now it's almost July. <laughs> if you asked me a few months ago, I would definitely say this year, but I think I think this year or early next, I think. We I have know. a lot, yeah, I mean, there's there's several anti-BCMAs and we, we have mounting data on the, not only talketamab, but also sevastamab, which we didn't mm -hmm. talk about today, but mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's bi-specific that targets FCRH5. And so they're coming. I mean, I think the take home is this is a very optimistic time to be um, if you have to have myeloma to be in the myeloma world, because we have a lot of therapies um, coming down the pike. And not only that, I think the real take home, I'm jumping the gun, but the real take home from ASCO, I think is, um, you know, there weren't as many novel therapies, but we're learning so much more about the therapies that are, are recently coming out and how to better deliver them and deliver them safely. And so I think that's equally as exciting as having brand new things, which we do. We have a lot of those too, you know, but having really effective drugs that we can use more effectively uh, yeah. is is the goal. And so I think that's a really exciting piece of that came out of the meeting. Yeah, totally agree. So Danielle, we we're talking about bispecific antibodies and increased risk of infection. So can you tell us why taking a bispecific antibody increases the risk of infection for patients? Sure. I think this is actually kind of two separate issues that occur in the same patient. So when we look at the um, kind of background of the patients that were receiving the biospecific, they were all greater than three lines of prior therapy. So when we think about their immune systems, it's already taken a hit. Most of these patients have had autologous stem cell transplants. They've had multiple lines of therapy, which can lower their immune system. And some may or may not have had CAR-T also prior to getting to the biospecifics, which we know is going to impact their immune system. And then when we start giving them the either the biospecific, whether it's tech or teclistabab or talclistabab, so tech or tal, um, you're targeting their T cells and our T cells are really the what's responsible for recognizing these foreign infections and helping our bodies fight it off. So when we have suppression of that, then we're going to increase the risk for infection in our patient population. Um, so when we think about the clinical trials that just came out, looking at both um, tech and tal, there was about a 50% risk of opportunistic or total infections in these patient populations. And when we're talking about infections, we're talking about bacterial infections, viral infections, and fungal infections. And in both studies, bacterial infections were the majority of the patients, followed by viral, and then fungal was about 7% in each one of the studies. Um, and, but what they did note also in the studies is about 64% of patients had hypogammaglobulinemia or low IgG levels. And so looking at the results of both study and taking that information to, um, to heart and how, how can we use that information to better take care of our patients. It's changing those protocols of what we're doing um, post kind of that induction therapy and how we need to protect our patients. So at our institution, all of our patients are on some type of antiviral therapy to prevent shingles reactivation. And we use mostly Valtrex. Um, we start patients on PCP or PJP prophylaxis. And so polycystic pneumonia is an opportunistic infection that you see in the severely immunocompromised patient. If you don't have a sulfa allergy in fairly good counts, then Bactrim tends to be our go-to. And there's other medications that we can use if somebody has an allergy or intolerance to Bactrim. And then we're also starting our patients on IVIGs monthly. And especially for those who have IgG levels less than 400, um, those are the ones we're starting and then kind of monitoring those IgG levels. And if they're getting above 600 or in those higher ranges, then you can look at how much we want to continue on with that. In addition to that, we've added in um, looking at some viruses like cytomedically a virus. And so we're monitoring for that as well. So that if we're starting to see you mount um, viral loads, so are expressing that virus in your bloodstream, we're allowed, we can adjust for that and do the treatments to prevent you from having any um, systemic side effects like diarrhea or GI or um, GI symptoms that are or further count drops that can we can see with CMV viremia. Mm -hmm. When you look at the two studies head to head, looking at tech and tau, there was a little bit less risk of infections with tau versus tech, but overall had kind of a similar um, infection risk with both um, with both drugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, it's a recurring theme, and there's a lot of talk about how to really better protect patients who become so much more susceptible to infection while they're taking these bispecifics. So hopefully we'll be able to solve that issue um, moving forward. Well, I think so, some of that, sorry, it's not just prophylaxis, but also the interval. 
which Danielle right. already mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, so that gives the patient's immune system a little bit of break as well. Yeah. yeah. Some, uh, some time to recover from that. Yeah. So and then I'll, and then like Dr. Joseph mentioned before, if, as we add in other drugs to these, are we going to increase their risk for infections as well too? So I think it's also looking at the, how we're, how we're using the medications. Is it single agent? Are we using it in combination with other medications too? And how do we prophylactically um, take care of our patients in that population or in that setting as well? Yeah, makes sense. Okay, so let's talk finally here about um, a couple of studies that were mentioned that um, on belantamab methadone, also known as Blenrev. Um, and many in our audience might not understand why this is still being investigated since this, this compound was withdrawn, was approved for myeloma patients, but was withdrawn from the market last year. So Dr. Joseph, what is Blenrev? And is this drug still being used for myeloma patients? Yeah, so Blenrev or Belamaf is an antibody drug conjugate. So it's an anti-BCMA. So it basically delivers a, a chemotoxic agent directly to the myeloma cell. So gloms onto the myeloma cell and then says, here's, here's some poison, here you go. And so um, the, the reason it was pulled, it got accelerated approval. So some of this is just about the FDA and kind of the rules and policies around accelerated approval. And unfortunately in the DREAM3 randomized trial, which was supposed to be a confirmatory trial looking at Bellamap versus POMDEX, there wasn't a statistically significant benefit of Bellamap over POMDEX. Having said that, I don't think, I'm, I'm a little optimistic that the nail in the coffin is, is not in there yet. And so GSK is, is continuing to run the studies that were already open mm -hmm. uh, with the hope that you know this might change. And I will say anecdotally, though I think there's challenges with Bellamap, I have several patients who really benefited from Bellamap, particularly more frail older patients um, mm -hmm. who have gone through standard, you know, or penta refractory, it can be a really helpful tool. So, okay. you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're able to use it again. But um, the two trials that were updated, one was the original trial that I just mentioned, which is DREAM3. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there were significant um, changes in kind of the data. It continued to not show a significant statistically significant benefit in PFS or, rem or that first remission, um, although it was longer in the bell arm, but just not statistically significant. So it was 11 months versus seven months. Um, and it did show um, better duration of response in the bell arm as well, for what it's worth. I think, um, you know, I, I think we need more time and we'll see. And then the second trial is DREAM9, which is looking at Bellamath, excuse me, in addition to RVD, which is a standard induction regimen in transplant ineligible patients up front. Um, and it showed reasonable um, efficacy, actually it was 100% actually in the highest Bellamath dosing, so good efficacy. In terms of toxicity, you know, the main side effect of Bellamath that was a little different is ocular toxicity. You know, a lot, for a lot of these drugs, hematologic toxicities and GI toxicities we can manage, we're hematologists. So, you know, low platelets don't, don't bother us with Bellamath. Um, we had a lot of vision changes. And I think that can be challenging, particularly in older patients who might have baseline vision changes in general, like cataracts and things like that. And so there were about 50% of patients on this trial had grade three or higher ocular events. So I just point that out in terms of um, we're using Bellamap in the upfront setting. For me, I worry a little bit about that because we have other drugs that are better tolerated like daratumumab. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very easy drug to deliver. And even in a frail patient, I have a 91 year old on, on Dara wow. Rebdex right now and doing very well. He's a very active 91 year old, but I would not give him Bellamap, you know, in the mm -hmm. upfront setting. So, you know, this is an early trial and we have more to learn about it. And I'm impressive that it's so effective, but I think also quads can be quite effective. So I think it's really about finding the right quad. Mm -hmm. But um, I think still a lot of data. Dream 5 is still open. You know, the dream trials are still open and um, hopefully, you know, we'll see still a role for Bellamap. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I think I've heard every myeloma doc that I've talked to has at least one patient who's had great responses with um, Blenrap. And thankfully, these patients, even though the drug has been removed from the market, these patients are still able to receive the drug with an individual um, IND. IND, like, that's right. So we still have several people off trial on Bella, um, and if, if it was working for them when, when this happened. Yeah, yeah, so they're still able to receive it. So, uh, I mean, I think the, the, the jury may be still out on that. We'll see what happens as more data is, is gathered from some of the other dream trials. Yeah. Okay. So um, we're close to the end of our hour here. So I've got my final question. 
for all of you. Um, was there any data presented at this meeting overall that will immediately affect how you manage your patients? And what is the take home message for patients from ASCO? Rosie, I'll start with you. So yeah, I think um, a lot of the data was really exciting. It was really promising. <clears throat> and I'm lucky to work in a place where we're constantly evaluating our practice and updating our recommendations based off the most recent literature. That's what I absolutely love about my job. Um, and I think the take home message is, is that there is really promising developments in both existing therapies and new therapies um, and that patients just need to be there, stay informed, be their best advocates and I think exciting things are to come. Yeah, agree. Danielle? I have to uh, um, echo at Rosie. It's, um, I've been at Emory for a long time, and it's great to see how the advances that we've made in the myeloma landscape for treatment. I mean, going from just kind of Rethlman and Velcade to now having these biospecifics and CAR-T, it's, you know, it's, we never want patients to have oncology. I would love to be out of a, or have an oncologic diagnosis. It would be great to be out of a job because we have cures for everything. But at least for our patients that we have, we have all these drugs that we're able to get, not only give them good quality of lives, but have these longer dur duration of responses. Um, I think from ASCO right now, I think they're really the most exciting are all these biospecifics and the easy access that we can actually get to our patients. CAR-T is great, um, but it takes just a little bit longer. And so for that patient that needs the treatment now, we can get them onto Clistamab fairly easily and get them going and they're responding and they're doing well. So it's, it's exciting for our patients. Agreed, totally agree. Dr. Joseph, I'll give you the last word. Sure. I mean, I think that was, I agree with all of that. I think to say a few additional things, I think in terms of practice changing, I mean, I think the two things that I would maybe think about are, is the dosing of ticlistimab mm -hmm. and probably cartitude before. I think those are the two things that are probably more, most immediately going to change our practice. I think the rest is evolving. Mm -hmm. um, but like, like they, they said, um, a lot of optimism, a lot of exciting things. I think the last thing I'll just say to those of you watching um, you know, I'm biased, but I would just like to, you know, plug if you have myeloma or you have a loved one with myeloma or smoldering myeloma or plasma cell disorder, I really think it's worthwhile to have at least a consultation at an academic center because things are changing in myeloma so quickly. There are a lot of clinical trials. There's a lot of um, new developments, um, even just management, even if your therapy is working for you, but you're having side effects, you know, this is all we do every day. And so I think it can be really bad. There's actually data out there that people who are co-managed with an academic center tend to have better outcomes. And so I think, um, you know, if, if you're willing, um, sometimes we're not always close, you know, but several academic centers, not just Emory do, we don't do telehealth out of state, but several do, including Mayo, you know, so there's really opportunities to just get um, insight and, and, and just more information, which I think is, um, you know, the best thing you can do as a patient to equip yourself with knowledge and advocate for yourself. So um yeah great agree so, great so i agree with all of your points um i just think that you know as we you know sort of go you know run through our schedule of major meetings for the year it seems like every time we get to a major meeting like an asco or an ash or even now an ims there's always more extremely exciting data coming uh coming together for myeloma patients so there's just a lot of room for hope for myeloma patients with all these new therapies and new combinations of therapies and using therapies in earlier lines of treatment that I think is really going to go a long way to really, um, you know, improving quality of life for myeloma patients moving forward. So um, on behalf of the MMRF, I'd like to thank our panelists today, Dr. Joseph, uh, Rosie, and Danielle also. And I'd like to thank everyone for listening uh, today. Thank you for taking your time out of your day for listening. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Adaptive Biotechnologies, BMS, Cure, GSK, Carrier Farm, Regeneron, Sanofi, and Takeda Oncology for their sponsorship. If you have any additional questions about what you heard today, please don't hesitate to call our Patient Navigation Center and talk to our experienced oncology professionals on the phone. Their number is 1-888-841-6673. Thank you so much and have a great day.